Uh, welcome to the uh, NASCC, the Steel Conference. My name is Matt Kofchinski. Um, I'm actually the Pennsylvania Regional Director for McLaren Engineering Group. I'm also on the uh, planning committee for this conference. So if you have any suggestions for future topics, you can see me afterwards. I'll be here for just a short time. Uh, we're going to ask that we silence all cell phones, please. We'll take all questions at the end. And uh, we'd also like to ask that we don't take pictures during the the presentation. It's a little distracting. And also, you know, these slides will be available online through AISC afterwards, so you can get them then. This session is N28A, Solutions for Vibration Issues, Elevation, Evaluations and Retrofits. PDH code is on there. It's 34717. Our speakers today are Dr. Tom Murray and Dr. Brad Davis. Dr. Tom Murray is a Emeritus Professor of Structural Steel Design at Virginia Tech. He is the first author of the AISC Design Guide 11. He has published many papers on the subject of floor vibrations, so he's an excellent presenter on this topic, and he's presented in numerous countries. Uh, he is a member of AISC and AISI Specification Committees, as well as AISC Committee on Manuals and Textbooks. He has received excellence in teaching from University of Oklahoma, Virginia Tech, the Commonwealth, excuse me, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and AISC. In February he was, uh, 2002, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering, and in 2012 was named a distinguished member of AISCE. He is a graduate of Iowa State University, Lehigh University, and University of Kansas, where he received his PhD. The second speaker today will be Dr. Brad Davis. He is an associate professor in civil engineering at the University of Kentucky. He has eight years of experience in building design, emphasizing in healthcare facilities. He has approximately two dozen journal and conference papers on structural vibration, has presented seminars and webinars on the subject to various industry and professional groups. Uh, I know both of these guys have uh, been here before. Dr. Davis is a member of the AISC Committee on Manual and Textbooks as well, and he has served on a consultant for the Steel Solutions Center. He has received an excellence in teaching awards from University of Kentucky, and he's a graduate of Virginia Tech, where he received his PhD. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Murray, ready to roll. Thank you, Matt, and thank you all for coming. As it says, we're going to talk about solutions for vibration issues, mainly cases where there are lively floors or lively other types of structures. To start with, this is one of these AIA continuing education parts of the conference, so we have to do a little front-end work here. The course description is building occupants occasionally report annoying floor vibrations due to human activity. Similarly, human-induced vibration levels occasionally exceed the tolerance li limits of sensitive equipment that will be on the floor. In such cases, a retrofit solution may be or is necessary. There are four burning objectives here. This is all part of these AIAI requirements. Uh, I'll let you take a quick look at them rather than me reading them. And at the end, we get to ask you a question. So you can't go to sleep. All right. With that, the scope of the presentation is first, how we would recommend you evaluate a floor, a problem floor, or a problem structure, but specifically a problem floor. We have found over the years that there are some questionable uh, testing methods. I'd just like to point those out, talk about them very briefly. Dr. Davis will do that. And then some case studies. We'll take turns on a number of case studies that, where we worked on to correct vibration problems. The typical problem floor evaluation scenario is that the management may get complaints or will get complaints or did get complaints from occupants of the building. An engineer or sometimes a measurement company is then engaged. Hopefully preliminary calculations are done to estimate the properties of the floor in the response to walking. Then a site visit to make measurements, very carefully done. Obviously that data has to be reduced, report with recommendations made, and then possibly a retrofit. So a 
Let's look at some of these details. Preliminary calculations. We can go to AISC Design Guide 11, which is now the second edition. It was published a little less than two years ago. And or the SJI Technical Digest number five uh, for a manual method. Manual method would allow us to estimate the natural frequency of the floor and also estimate the acceleration due to walking. The manual method only though applies to what are called regular bays, that is rectangular bays, and it's best, works best if the surrounding areas are also rectangular or regular bays. If that's not the case, then there is a method in Design Guide 11, second edition, on how to use the finite element method to evaluate a floor. The process, of course, is to develop an FEA model, predict the natural mode, from which the natural frequency is there, of course, and then do a frequency resp uh, response function, FRF function prediction. From that, the acceleration prediction can be obtained. Dr. Davis will go through that in a little bit. Once we get to the site, first thing that one needs to know is what is the natural frequency of the floor? And surprisingly, the most accurate and easy way of doing this is to do a heel drop. Simply roll up on the balls of your feet, Hit the floor hard with your heels, but don't allow the balls of your feet to come up. That impact has a content of about 40 hertz, which nicely covers anything we would need and more than we need for a floor vibration evaluation. On the right, on the left on this slide is heel drop waveform from an actual heel drop on an actual building. That's processed using fast Fourier analysis to get a response spectrum. And from the response spectrum, one can determine the uh, dominant frequency, which in this case is, you can see it over on the, on the left there, is five hertz, and maybe a secondary frequency that may be important later. So with that then, we are ready to do some walking measurements. Now, the prediction methods in Design Guide 11 predict a, predict, predict a peak frequency, a peak sinusoidal frequency. And the basis behind it is that walking is at a subharmonic of that frequency. So it is the maximum response that you can expect from the floor for any walker, not from a particular walker, but for a walker who happens to walk at the subharmonic of the natural frequency of the floor. Their natural gait is at level. So we need to do timed walking to simulate what's behind what's in Design Guide 11. Problem floors are usually what we call low frequency floors means that the natural frequency is below about nine hertz. And therefore the occupant can cause resonance. I don't know how many times I've walked into a building with a lively or problem floor, and within 10 minutes, somebody will tell me that either Sally, who may weigh 120 pounds, causes the problem, or Joe, who may weigh 250 pounds, causes a problem. It's not necessarily associated with weight. It's their natural gait. And if their natural gait, walking through the office area, matches a subharmonic of the natural frequency, you're going to get the maximum response, and that's the one everybody is feeling or complaining about. Happens every time. So we need to cause residents during the tests. In order to do that, we need a step frequency. The normal range of step fre frequencies is 1.6 hertz to 2.2 hertz. So 
So the walking frequency for the measurement has to be within that range if we're doing a reasonable test. Resonance occurs when there a multiple of the step frequency equals the natural frequency of the floor. So for example, if we measured a floor that had a six hertz natural frequency, we're going to then start dividing that by integers. Of course, you know ahead of time what it's going to be, but in this case, we would divide by three and we'll get two hertz. We divide by two, we get three hertz, that's outside of the range. Divide by three, we get two hertz, that's within a normal walking range of 1.6 to 2.2 hertz. So that's the walking speed that's going to cause the maximum acceleration response. And that's what we're going to do to determine that response in, on the problem floor. How do we do this? Well, we use a metronome. It's used to uh, monitor the walking speed. Uh, engineers are, structural engineers, I should say, uh, have some trouble doing this. Uh, most structural engineers don't dance, I found. So if the architect is there, we give it to him or her, and they do a much better job because, no, never mind. Right. Forgot this is being recorded. All right. We want to use multiple individual walkers because the impact from a particular walker's uh, footstep is going to be completely different in almost all cases then, or somewhat different, I guess I should say, than another person. And we want to do multiple tests for a walker. Now, you can use all kinds of fancy equipment to do this. The simplest set is what's shown here on this slide. This is a seismic accelerometer. It's very sensitive at low frequencies, and it's a bit expensive, and it's also something that normal vibration measurement companies don't have because they're looking at machinery in most cases, or something, or looking at a bridge, for instance, where there's traffic. We use a metronome, as I said, here in the center, that any music store can sell you for 30 bucks in order to monitor the walking speed. And on the right is a handheld instrument that collects the data. This is an old, as a display, is, is a pilot, palm pilot, works just as well as uh, anything else. And connected back behind here is a data stick handheld analyzer. The analyzer records the data and also can process the data, as we'll see. There are other systems, of course. Dr. Davis uses one with two channels or four channels to make measurements when he goes to a site. We get raw data. Raw data is pretty worthless, actually. In this particular case, you see on the left a 16-second record, which is what the data stick that I showed on the previous slide takes. On top of that, there is a low frequency signal. There's a low free fre frequency signal, which is this one. It's only six seconds of this record with the 32 hertz uh, signal writing on top of it. That's very, very common that you see either 30 or 60 hertz uh, in these records because that's the equipment that's moving, that's, that's operating in the building. And these accelerometers are so sensitive that they'll pick that up even though you'll never feel it. So the record has to be filtered. And it's filtered between one and 15 to 20 hertz. Below one hertz is of no interest. We have, we as humans are not sensitive to vibration frequencies above 15 or so hertz. So it's filtered to that range. Also, individual peaks are not representative of what we feel. We don't go in there and look at the maximum acceleration at one point, okay? Because we're matching this to a sinusoidal or sinoid um, representation that's in the design guide. 
The tolerance limits in Design Guide 11 are peak cytosoidal accelerations, not peak particle accelerations. Many company measurement companies that are into other types of measurement work will pre report the maximum peak particle uh, acceleration, which way overestimates, in some cases, what a human would feel. We use what we called an equivalent sinusoidal peak acceleration. And rather than repeat that over and over again in the presentation, we're going to call it ESPA. It's computed so that we can compare accurately what we're measuring with what's in the design guides. The way that's done is to compute first the maximum rolling two second root mean square or RMS acceleration and then pick the maximum value of it in order to calculate the ESPA maximum value. So for example, on the record at t equal 1.8 seconds, the RMS is commuted, computed between 0.8 seconds and 2.8 seconds. And that's the RMS value then for 1.8. The maximum rolling RMS is then multiplied by the square root of 2 to get the ESPA. And the reason for that is if you have a pure sine wave, multiply that by 0 0.707 to get the RMS value. So we're taking the RMS value and dividing it or multiplying it by 1 over 707 or square root of 2 to get it back to a peak value which we'll then compare with the, with the acceleration limits that are in the design guide. Let's take an example. Here's a 16 second measurement at a walking speed of 101 steps per minute. 101 steps per minute is 1.68 hertz. The natural frequency of this system, or the, which results in, is equivalent to, I should say, a natural frequency of 5.06 hertz divided by 3. So on the left here is the filtered uh, me measured acceleration versus time, 16 seconds. The red line is RMS value multiplied by the square root of 2. The maximum value here is an acceleration. If you can't read it, it's 0.622% of gravity. The limit for quiet environments in the design guide, the recommended limit, is 0.5% of gravity. So the response here would be easily felt by and occupy in a quiet space. The walking was done at one third of this frequency and was hit right on the button. There's the 5.06 hertz. And that's the amount of energy or maximum measured peak acceleration at that location. So if we have to retrofit, which we would for a case like this, or at least we would certainly recommend it because they already had complaints. Possible retrofit options are to strengthen the supporting members. Now, to do that means we're going to weld something to the bottom cord or the bottom flange of the supporting members. And I emphasize welding. I tried many years ago every way possible to figure out a way to strengthen Joyce, for instance, using bolted construction, using turn, turnbuckles, and it's just not possible. Humans are extremely sensitive vertical vibration sensors. Ten thousandths of an inch right now where you're sitting, you would be uncomfortable. You would, you would mention it or possibly even complain about it. Okay? So we're trying to reduce ten thousandths of an inch to five thousandths of an inch, Whatever we put in there must be very, very stiff. So that's why welding is required. In addition, we have to get some strain into whatever we're adding to the structure. So we have to jack up the floor a little bit, quarter to a half inch, 
then weld the reinforcement to the bottom cord or the bottom flange. Well, welding in an occupied building is not something that can be done most times. It's certainly not going to be cheap, and with computers in the building, that's extremely risky. So if the building is occupied, strengthening in this manner is usually not an option. Second possibility is to increase the mass of the floor. Usually that's not possible because of strength limitations. It takes a lot more mass, it takes a lot of mass to, to make any effect on the response of the floor system. You can add more concrete. When you add more concrete, you get more mass, you get a larger moment of inertia, and you also get stiffness in transverse directions. If you're just adding mass in terms of concrete slabs or blocks, we only get one of the three parts that I just said to improve the response of the floor. Many times it's possible to install post before, be, below a lively floor, especially if it's the same tenant. The posts have to go to grade. Where I realized this one time, I suggested posts between two floors couldn't go to grade because there was a parking lot down, parking garage below it. And the next day we took the post out because I had doubled the problem. If somebody on the upper floor did that. Everybody knew it and knew why it happened. Now you get the response on the floor below and they don't know what's going on and they're not happy. So the post came out pretty quick. There was no way to go to grade. Done this by hiding the post or disguising the post as electrical drops or communication drops. They don't have to be a big post because we're dealing with only the loads from humans. And if they don't have a lot of capacity and the load changes, axial capacity, the load changes, they'll simply buckle and there won't be a problem. The other possibility is to add damping. And the only way I know of adding damping in the floor system is use what's called a tune mass damper. And we'll talk more about a tune mass damper toward the end of the session. Now, I'd like to go through an example project here where the floor was actually fixed by welding structural member to the bottom cord of the joist. This was an office building in southwest United States. The area, the shaded area there uh, was partially occupied. Uh, it had uh, work cubicles for fuel, fuel, full occupancy, uh, but at the time there was only about, it was only about 50% occupied. There were complaints there. Uh, they threatened to sue, so the, engin the engineer of record went to his insurance company. The insurance company hired a lawyer immediately, and then I was hired by the lawyer. The floor system is not unusual. It's four inch total depth, normal weight concrete, one and a half inch deep deck. The joists were 24 VC, meaning composite joist, uh, with a total load design of 300 pounds per foot. They were at 80 inches on center, and they spanned 40 feet. Along the, the outside here was a wall, so the support of the joist on that side was a wall. On the other side, grid line two, it was a joist girder. The area where people were complaining the most is this smaller area shown here. And in fact, they had put nine one foot concrete, one foot concrete cubes under various desks, thinking that that would help the vibration problem. I just happened to notice these. They didn't even tell me they were there. But it had, as we'll see here in a minute, very little effect. The predicted response of the floor without the concrete cubes was a joist frequency of 
5.05 hertz, a Joyce Girder frequency of 5.10 hertz, and then if you combine the two using what's called Dunkerley's equation, as it do, is done in Design Guide 11, 3.6 hertz. The predicted acceleration without the blocks was 0.99% of G, much greater than the quiet limit of 0.5%, assuming a damping ratio, beta there is damping, a damping ratio of 2.5%. The way you get that is 1% for ceiling and ductwork, which was below, 1% for the structural system, and then a half percent or one percent for the fit out, depending if it's what's called electronic office or a paper office. An engineer in office being a paper office with paper and stuff all over the place. Electronic office one where there's just consoles and computer screens. Put the cubes in place, you can see how there's little change it made, right? Reduce the frequency by a little bit. This is all predictions now. The frequencies by a little bit and change this by one hundredth of a percent. So it was really a waste of time and money to do that. All right, we went out and measured. The cubes were there. Like I said, they didn't tell me were there. I just happened to notice them. The measured frequency was four point one hertz, somewhere between the the uh, Bay frequency and the Joyce frequency. And we did walking, as I said, this time at 205 hertz, which is one half of the 4.1 hertz, or 123 steps per minute, which was in, is in the range of normal walking. And a 200 pound man, 210 pound man, 160 pound man, and look who caused the largest acceleration. The 160 pound man. He was much better at walking at, he was a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that walking at the metronome, metronome than the engineers were. There was also a woman who could really get the floor moving, and they didn't want me to ask her to walk that particular day. So the, the accelerations, the measured accelerations, the predicted accelerations are greater, greater than 0.5% G, and it was decided to retrofit this building. What they did is, or what we did is, we removed the concrete cubes. We then, through finite element analysis that Dr. Davis did, decided that we could, if we stiffened the joist by welding W10 by 15, 20 feet long to the bottom cords, we could reduce the predicted acceleration to point, a little over 0.6% G. And then, if that was not satisfactory, could go back in and stiffen the joist seats on the joist girder to increase the composite action between the concrete slab and the joist girder and get it down to a little over 0.5% of G. Well, in order to do this, they had to remove the tenants from right below it. They put them in a temporary place. It took a lot of negotiation to get the people to agree to do that. It was full of computers, but they were willing to make the fix. And you can see here where W, remember I said 15, that can't be a 15, where the W, whatever they were, are welded to the bottom cords of the joist, where they're welded only at the panel points. Required removing the ceiling, of course, and a set of three or four joists were jacked up and the beams welded on it, and then they just moved across this whole area, not just a little area where the concrete blocks were. With one bay completed, I was asked to go back. The measured frequency was nine, now five hertz. So the walking is at 1.67, five and divided by three. The 200 pound, nine pound man, I guess he lost a pound in between times. Uh, response was 0.46% of G. The 170-pound man got it down to 0.31% G. And this time, we just waited long enough until this lady walked through and everybody was okay with her. 
<laughs> so accelerations were down to 0.5% G. The owner of the occupants agreed that the tenants, I should say, not the owner of the building, agreed that the retrofit was successful. Well, the ceiling was put back up, the people moved back in, and that's the end of my story. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brad Davis to talk about a number of things. Good afternoon. I'll start with uh, a short section on our uh, questionable testing methods that we've noticed over the years. And the first, as Dr. Murray mentioned earlier, is the use of these peak particle velocities or accelerations uh, in the measured records. Uh, as you can see at the bottom left here, we have a measured uh, vibration waveform. And you can see that the equivalent sinusoidal peak acceleration is, this thing was working a minute ago, now it's not now, is 0.531% G. And uh, the peak is about here, that's 0.875% G. And this is fairly common. This is with a filtered record. If it was unfiltered, that could have been way higher than that. Now, the, that, that peak is just not representative. People's, the, the, the perception of the people on the floor is not gonna be super affected by that. They're gonna be affected more by the, the more persistent vibration, and, and that's represented by the ESPA. So we really wanna be looking at the ESPA. And as you see on the right there, there we have the tolerance limits from Design Guide 11, Chapter 2, and those are sinusoidal peak accelerations. That's what those are. Those are not just the peak or zero to peak or there's various other, other names for it, or the PPA. It's not that, it's the sinusoidal peak. So that's why we want to use something other than these PPA or PPV uh, records. Okay, next, uh, long-term monitoring. I think this has some potential, but there's, there's some, so there, there are some things we have to, to be aware of and some things to, that we need, need to caution you about. First is it, these really need to be paired with video monitoring so that you know what caused the vibration events. Um, you can see on the right a, a two minute two minutes of the uh, of a, a, a two minute chunk of a long term monitoring record, and you you know we can look at those and kind of guess at what caused them, but we're not really sure uh, these individual events. So we, we we really need video monitoring there. Even that's going to be a little tricky, though, because we see the leg jiggling, and, 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 and there are other excitations that the video monitoring may not capture as well. So it's a little, it's a little tricky there. That's, this is why we like the type of test Dr. Murray described earlier. Okay, I've also seen a, a few comments about using cell phones for measurements. Of course, all of our cell phones have accelerometers in there. Um, first thing about, about this is our vibration measurements require extremely detailed control over many parameters, ranging from the sampling frequency, the range of the input, uh, voltage, uh, bandwidth of the measurement, and so on. There's lots of different parameters that we control with. Uh, we spend a lot of effort trying to, to control those just exactly so. If we have very simplified equipment, we're not gonna have that. So we, we, we need to watch out for that. 